Good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of the Cyberbyte sessions. Uh, my name is Grant Campbell, I'm a commercial partner in Brodie's and a member of the Data Protection and Information Law team. In terms of this session, as you recall, last month we featured a really informative and practical session from Moe Kerr, who's an ethical hacker at the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. And he talked about the work of the SBRC and how organisations can prepare and protect themselves against cyber attacks. This time, we're joined by Vanessa Cathy. Vanessa is Vice President of Global Cyber and Technology at Lockton. And she's going to talk about cyber insurance, current market trends, and what insurance brokers see as the key considerations when considering cyber insurance. A New Zealand qualified barrister and solicitor, Vanessa has been involved in commercial and business advisory work for over 25 years, focused on the insurance sector, Vanessa located to Lockton in September 2019, where she joined the professional uh, financial services team. With a particular focus on cyber technology and risk, Vanessa works across various insurance classes, addressing policy wording, product development, client coverage and advocacy, and regularly contributes to industry publications on issues relating to cyber. As we saw in the last weekend with the Tesco incident affecting uh, its website and its app, the threats are real and so is this disruption. So the question is what part does insurance have to play and what is the perspective of insurers in a rapidly evolving cyber landscape? Uh, Vanessa, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much Grant and hello everyone and a big thanks to Brodie's for inviting me to participate in the Cyberbytes series. Uh, we've got quite a bit to cover today, so I'm going to canter through and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, if not, if we don't get to all the questions, please feel free to either email me or contact me on LinkedIn and I, I can get back to you with some answers. Today we're going to be talking about all things cyber insurance. So as Grant mentioned, I work for Lockton uh, Insurance Brokers, so we're a brokerage firm rather than an insurance company. Uh, our role as you'll appreciate, is to act for a company in helping them put insurances in place. So we have a fiduciary responsibility to the insured uh, and we help them put the best insurances in place by going to the various insurance markets. So as uh, Grant said today, we're talking about specifically cyber insurance. So first slide, please, thank you. So first of all, I uh, actually, I think we're one slide back, there's an introduction slide. There we go, thank you. So first up, I'd like to discuss the sorts of events that we're typically talking about in the cyber context. I, I thought it would be helpful to set the scene to get our heads around the type of events that we're typically talking about within the context of a cyber insurance policy. So generally speaking, events that trigger a cyber policy are divided into two types. The first is what we might term a typical cyber event, and the second is a privacy breach of some sort. So looking at the cyber event, items one to six are examples of the sorts of cyber events that we're talking about in this context. So malware, a hacking event, a phishing attempt, et cetera. DDoS is a distributed uh, denial of service. The sorts of things that the layperson on the street might typically identify as being a cyber event. And you'll see on the right hand side there, I've indicated six yeses. Uh, for the first points one to six because they are the things that are typically triggers for an insurance policy and now i say typically because unfortunately there's no such thing as a standard cyber policy uh, they tend to vary a little bit from market to market but in general terms those first items one to six are the sorts of things the sorts of triggers that will be in play when we're talking about a cyber insurance policy the, the last two, items seven and eight, they've got a no next to them, as you'll see, and it's because they are generally not covered under a cyber policy. Uh, so system failure, they're number seven, that is when your technology or your software may not be working. So it's generally not covered in cyber insurance policies, although some policies will extend to it, but typically you might need a separate technology errors and emissions policy to cover system failure. Number eight is not ever covered in cyber policies. Um, I think it's fairly safe, safe to say that it's infrastructure failure. So when there's some massive systemic failure of perhaps the internet power shortage, et cetera, which would have a widespread effect. 
So I just mentioned those two as they are, they are worthy of specific notes. You're not going to find coverage for them in a cyber policy. But the second uh, context is cyber breach. So cyber policies also typically respond to privacy data related breaches. So the sorts of things we're talking about is if somebody in your business accidentally releases a whole bunch of data into the public domain, or it gets held to ransom uh, and threatened to be released into the domain, as we'll talk about shortly, where you have an ensuing liability to a data subject and perhaps the Information Commissioner's Office, Commissioner, Commissioner's Office the ICO, in those sorts of situations, you would expect a, a cyber policy to respond. And you might ask why are data breaches covered in a cyber policy, as they don't necessarily have to involve a cyber event per se, but it's because privacy and data related breaches typically take place in cyberspace. And often they do coincide with a cyber event taking place, uh, more on that shortly. So the next slide, please. Market update. So many of you will have read the headlines over the last 18 months or so. Ransomware attacks have been increasing exponentially. They were already on the rise pre-lockdown, but when the pandemic hit, many businesses quickly adapted to having a working from home workforce, which wasn't necessarily as cyber secure as the in-office network. Cyber criminals took full advantage of this. Uh, and the number of ransomware attacks just went through the roof. Interestingly, though, over the past few months, the number of ransomware attacks has decreased a little bit, as has the average and medium, median ransom amounts. But it's fair to say that the attacks have become far more targeted. Criminals are now creating and launching very sophisticated and pointed attacks with substantial su success. So just a little bit of history around ransomware. Typically, going back a few years, it was only about the encryption. So a criminal would lock up a network system and demand a sum of money in exchange for a decryption key. That was historically your, your typical ransom attack. What was happening, though, is that some businesses were able to circumvent the process of having to pay the ransom demand by restoring their systems from backups. So the cyber criminals quickly adapted their model to what we term the two-pronged approach. And this we have been seeing uh, over the last 18 months, particularly by two cyber criminal gangs, one called Maze and the other one called Revil. They essentially exfiltrate data. So first of all, they gain access to your business, to your, to your, to your network system. And that could be a number of months before you even know about it, actually. They, they can often gain access via somebody in your system clicking on a phishing link and then they can uh, they can tunnel through your system on an unmonitored basis basically taking out data or, or extricating information that they, they might find useful so in this two-pronged approach what they do is exfiltrate data prior to locking the system then they do the old school uh, action which is demanding a sum for the de decryption key which you may decide to pay once that's paid they often come back for a second demand, threatening that if the second amount isn't paid, they will release that data, public, uh, sorry, private sensitive data out into the public domain. So obviously not the sort of thing that can necessarily be protected by way of backups. The third point there under ransomware is ransomware as a service. This is a really um, interesting phenomenon that's, uh, that's been increasing over the last year or so. Criminal enterprises have stepped up their activities, which is essentially them offering ransomware as a service to affiliates, as they call them, in exchange for a cut. So Revil, the one gang I mentioned before, operates in this manner. They basically sell their ransomware as a service model to affiliates. When their affiliates uh, execute a ransom demand and get paid, they typically keep 70% and pay 30% 30, 30 to Revil. So this is something we're seeing more and more frequently. Point two about the dark web, you know, where does all this information end up? Typically on the dark web, there is always a market for it. Uh, earlier this month, I was on a website which had some updated figures on what various items of data were selling for on the dark web. Uh, passport details, for instance, have an average value of about 15 US dollars per, per passport detail. Currently, um, though it does depend on the nationality. So a Russian passport was um, 
the, the uh, average amount for a Russian passport was about $100 US. So SMEs, I, I wanted to mention SMEs briefly as many of us could be forgiven for thinking that small to medium enterprises are not even the subject of attack as they rarely feature in the headlines. However, anecdotally, we are seeing huge numbers of smaller businesses being hit by cyber attacks, either directly as they're often rightly or wrongly seen as a soft target with smaller IT security budgets, but they may also be vulnerable to attacks on their supply chain. And we've been seeing a lot of this over the last year or so. This year, we've seen attacks on Microsoft Exchange, Acilion, SolarWinds, Kaseya, all of which were not directly uh, targeted at the SMEs, but they caused considerable collateral damage to many SMEs. Point four, governance. Uh, this is a really important issue. Cyber risk is not just a technical issue. I say just because it's too easy to pass it off on the IT department. So this is in your area of expertise. It's a business risk that needs to be dealt with at a boardroom level. Boards and managers must act responsibly and vigilantly on the topic. Gone are the days of divesting all responsibility to the IT department. It's important that there is a clear line of responsibility for identifying and mitigating perceived threats, but also for establishing protocols when something goes wrong. And an interesting point to note is that directors and officers of businesses who fail adequately to identify, assess and mitigate cyber threats could be at risk for failing to consider their business liability exposures adequately. So just a point to note there. There's also a lot of data which indicates that businesses put that which, which put more focus on cyber hygiene have higher cyber performance metrics, which means it is less likely they'll suffer a cyber breach and therefore less likely the organization will suffer a financial or reputational loss. So high cyber security performance is a key indicator of good governance, which is likely to translate into better business confidence and shareholder value. Next slide, please. Losses. So generally, the sorts of losses that will ensue from a cyber event will fall into two categories, termed first party losses and third party liability. So first party losses, as set out in item one, these are the costs that are paid upfront for a business to deal with a cyber event. It also extends to business interruption losses due to an outage. So we've got their legal costs uh, for responding to claims, notification costs, et cetera, call center costs if, if that's necessary, the IT forensics to come in and actually look at what's happening in your system, stop the attack and secure it for, uh, against future attacks. PR and crisis management is a really key area that a lot of businesses uh, need help with. Extortion demand and the surrounding expenses, regulatory expenses and fines. Uh, I just mentioned a bit about the fines there. If you have a data breach and you have to account to the, to the ICO for, for that breach, typically the, you're going to be faced with a whole bunch of investigation expenses. You also could be uh, pinged with a fine, as we know. I will come on to coverage within the insurance, within a cyber insurance policy shortly, but it's important to note that fines are unlikely to be covered. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later on, but the, the wording of a cyber insurance policy does extend to coverage being available in the event that those uh, fines are deemed to be legal, but it, it is likely that they will not be legally insurable. Uh, we've touched on business interruption losses. And I just mentioned money loss there because typically money is not, money loss is not covered in a cyber policy. So the sorts of things we're talking about there would be the cyber equivalent of a good old fashioned smash and grab. So if you have a chunk of money that disappears from your, from your, uh, from your network or via your network, that would not typically be covered under a cyber policy. You need a separate crime cover for that. There are some cyber policies that will give you a, a small, sublimited amount for money loss, but it tends to be um, 100,000 pounds, 250,000 pounds used to be possible. That's uh, slightly less common these days. So typically speaking, money loss is dealt with by way of a separate crime policy. 
third party liability is, as the name suggests, for liability to other parties. So this might be, for instance, in relation to a privacy breach, the insured having transmitted a virus to another party's system inadvertently, interferences with your computer system or website or platform that create some liability for you as the insured because your customers or clients can't access it. So those are the sorts of areas in which you can be liable to third parties. So those are sorts of losses that you can uh, potentially be uh, in line for in the event of a cyber event. Next slide, please. So cyber insurance, just a brief note to start with on the trigger for a policy. Liability cover is triggered when a claim is made. So it, you, it will fall for cover under whatever policy is placed when the claim is in place when the claim is received. It's called claims made, a claims made policy. First party losses, this is quite an interesting point that's not well understood. They can differ as to whether they're triggered by an occurrence of a, of a cyber event or the discovery of the occurrence of the cyber event. There's quite a significant difference there and not all markets have the preferred wording there, which is it should be triggered by the discovery of the occurrence, not the occurrence itself. Because as alluded to before, you can have somebody in your system monitor, uh, unmonitored going around tunneling around in your network for months or even years before they are discovered. So you want the policy to be triggered as far as first party losses are concerned by the discovery of the event, not the happening of the event. So broadly speaking, policies are structured in two sections, according to the first and third party losses. Um, most policies are set up in the same sort of way. That's what they cover. Silent cyber deserves a mention. It, it, from my perspective, it's one of the most ironically named concepts. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this now. The concept of silent cyber is anything but silent. It's been screaming at me for the past um, two or three years. And it's the subject of many discussions and debates in insurance circles. Essentially, a few years ago, Lloyd's decided that many traditional insurance policies were not sufficiently clear as to whether they covered some degree of cyber loss or not. So this is sort of harking back to um, cyber, standalone cyber insurance policies not being that common. So tr the more traditional policies, whether it was um, general liability or property or professional indemnity, they may had, have had some degree of cyber cover, but it was silent. It wasn't affirmed. It was just a sort of gray area, which caused a lot of discontent in the market when it came to claims time, because th there were some issues as to whether or not uh, cyber related um, losses and, and liabilities were actually covered. So Lloyd's in 2018 decided enough of this, we need to get a bit of clarity around this. So since the beginning of 2020, there has been a gradual rollout of Lloyd's insurance markets requiring non-standalone cyber policies, so the more traditional policies, to be either affirmative or exclusionary with respect to whether they cover cyber. What this means is that um, for a lot of professional services, this has been a, a big issue this year because it has impacted a lot on their professional indemnity cover. So whereas typically there may have been a little bit of silent cyber coverage in the PI policy, that is typically now not being affirmed. It's the markets are typically saying we're going to exclude it in your professional indemnity policy, which means that there unfortunately is more of a need now for parties to purchase separate standalone cyber cover because that cover is no longer there within a PI policy. I have to say though that um, as we talked about before, a, a standalone cyber policy is the far preferable option in the event of a cyber event anyway because it does cover first party losses including breach response whereas you're, not, you're only going to get third party cover in a PI policy. So it might sound um, and pleasant to think that in order to gain the same degree of cover, you now have to purchase a standalone silent cyber, sorry, a standalone cyber insurance policy. But the markets are now generally saying for something that was traditionally um,
caused by a SARB event, that should be covered in a cyber policy, not in a PI policy or a property policy or a general liability policy. Thank you, next slide please. So cyber hygiene standards, um, as a result of the ransomware increase, there has been a heightened focus on cyber hygiene standards by the insurance markets. Greater underwriting scrutiny has been brought to bear on insurance processes, and there are some protocols that are now seen as minimum standards without which you may not even be likely to get a cyber quote. So these include multi-factor authentication, MFA, which we can equate to locks on the windows and doors in, in a property type scenario. MFA is another lock uh, that a cyber criminal will have to go through in order to gain access to the system. Uh, EDR, endpoint protection, we equate that to the sprinklers in a traditional uh, policy. Uh, it's basically helping mitigate the damage once there has been access. Uh, PAM, privileged access management is another thing that most insurers are now insisting on and a really robust backup program whether it's daily offline multiple times a day etc um, insurers are going to want to see sorry insurers are going to want to see those four minimum standards failing which it'll be very difficult to get a cyber quote the market has hardened so quickly over the last uh, year and a half as well as this, there are some recommended standard, standards which are not compulsory, but they do serve to paint you in a better light with the, insureds, with the insurers. So incident response plan, having a business continuity plan, a protocol in respect of software updates, patching, password management, vul uh, vulnerability assessments is a, is a really good one, and working with a third party cyber security team to make sure that you've uh, tested your, your systems. Separation of IT and operational technology is a really big one as well. Thank you, next page please. So incident response from a cyber insurance perspective, one of the big benefits, as I alluded to before, of a cyber insurance policy is the breach response team. So one of the, uh, the biggest benefits is a 24 seven hotline where you'll be put in contact with a breach response coach who is typically a lawyer who will put together a breach response team which includes a PR and crisis management consultant, um, IT, forensics people, etc. If there is a demanded ransom, you may be given access to a ransom demand negotiator. This is a really, really beneficial, beneficial um, key aspect of a cyber insurance policy because often these negotiators have experience dealing with exactly the same cyber gang. So they will know whether or not you're likely to get your decryption key back if you choose to pay. Um, ironically, as it may seem, there is actually a um, code of conduct for cyber criminals. Um, if you pay them and they don't then front up with the decryption key, then that compromises their business model. They'll only get away with that a certain number of times before their business model is, is no longer viable. So typically, uh, despite what many people think, if you pay, you will get your money back. Um, it's not fail safe, of course, but dealing, dealing with one of these experienced ransom negotiators will help you uh, in terms of their modus operandi and your likelihood of getting um, access back and all your data back. Just on the issue of ransom demands, it's really um, a topical question on whether or not it is legal to pay the ransom. Subject to a couple of exceptions, it is not actually illegal in the UK to pay a ransom demand. There are aspects of the Terrorism Act 2000 that you could be in breach of if you choose to pay it. So that to one side, uh, it's not actually illegal and nor is it illegal in the US unless there is some affiliation with a sanctioned country on the OFAC list. Uh, there are obviously issues in and around the morality and the legality and I, I think my, my approach to this is that there is not one size fits all. If you are a healthcare business, for instance, your main driving focus will be the protection of your patients if you're a hospital. Uh, if you have a ransomware attack which takes out all your 
computer network and your uh, health devices, your medical devices, your monitoring equipment, then that there is a real chance there of somebody being hurt or losing their life because of it. So in those sorts of situations, as much as we'd like to say we should never pay um, a ransom demand, the priority has to be, I think, first and foremost, human safety. And th there are there's no one size all approach in, in terms of how best to deal with that. It, it's a it's a case by case individual basis, I believe. Um, and just a note that the insurance company must always approve of a ransom demand. Um, typically insurer responses are such that they will want to get the company back on its feet as quickly as possible. The last point there is that the broker typically assists with claims management and acts as a bit of an interface between the insured and the insurance company, uh, acting uh, assisting as third party liability claims come in and first party costs are paid. So may we have the next slide please. So in a nutshell, I think it's safe to say that there are really three aspects to focus on when it comes to cyber hygiene standards. And the three really need to work together as different and complementary parts of the jigsaw puzzle, and they are not mutually exclusive. The most obvious is the network security. Um, any business needs to have cyber security tools in place to minimize the threat. And there are, as I suggested before, any number of cyber security professionals who can assist with this. Vulnerability assessments are really important, including penetration testing, red teaming, tabletop exercises. They're critical as well as putting in place um, standard anti-threat protections, antiviral software, et cetera. Also putting in place a business continuity plan and incident response plan is absolutely key. So they're parts of the network security protection, um, protecting the perimeter of your system, point one. That said, it doesn't really matter how many firewalls or how much antiviral software a business has purchased, as there will typically also often be threats from within a business, either from an employee who accidentally releases a lot of data into the public sphere, or perhaps clicks on a uh, phishing link, or even a disgruntled employee who decides to go rogue and malicious, maliciously causes a cyber event to take place. So education and training are key, and these are elements that insurance companies will also look at <clears throat> in terms of your business's ability to mitigate the accidental insider threat. The external threat can be mitigated with robust whistleblowing protocols, which is an important piece of the puzzle too. And then the last piece is the cyber insurance for when something goes wrong. So as I said, the three work hand in hand together. Um, bear in mind that you don't even need to have done anything wrong to be liable for cyber related breaches. Your network perimeter could be absolutely top notch and your cyber hygiene protocols could be really robust but you could, could get compromised by a rogue employee, as we've suggested, or by a supply chain hack in the case of Kaseya or SolarWinds, et cetera. So I love that quote from James Scott there, there's no silver bullet solution with cyber security, a layered defense is the only uh, viable defense and, and I do stand by that. So thank you, we've come to the end of the slides, I think. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Vanessa, that was, that was fantastic. It was very informative. Um, we have a number of questions. I suppose my observation, listening to that, well, a couple of observations, but it seems to me that it, general awareness and understanding of what policies organizations actually have um, is really critical. And it seems that actually the wording of the policy is key. So knowing what your cyber, if you have a cyber policy, what it covers and how it fits in with any other policies that you may have. You mentioned you mentioned technology and errors, you mentioned crime. So actually understanding what insurance you have, what actual policies you have, and how they fit into your wider insurance environment seems to me to be pretty key. Do you think organizations understand that? Hopefully events like this help. <laughs> That's a really great question, Grant, and I think that there is a, um, a greater awareness now of the, the scope for us and the need for a separate standalone cyber policy, but we have had 
uh, clients come to us telling us that they have cyber insurance and when we drill down on it they have a traditional property policy or a PI policy that has an element of cyber cover as we touched on before the silent cyber cover so I think as the cyber insurance market has dynamically increased over the last 10 to 15 years so has the cyber uh, policy wording itself so it is now very much a standalone bespoke wording that responds specifically to the cyber events that we've talked about here yeah I think uh, more and more people are starting to understand that now and, and I mean anecdotally I hear that you know the take-up of cyber insurance you know has been growing the market's growing who's who's driving that you <laughs> mentioned that that cyber is you know a governance issue and should be addressed at board level is it the boards that are driving the take up in insurance who's who typically is it that you see driving the increase in take up on cyber yeah thanks Grant. another great question and historically it has tended to be risk managers who have that specific job of looking at insurances etc but over the last couple of a uh, couple of years i suspect partly due to the horrific rise in ransomware cases over that, that period of time boards and governors have taken a much more uh, proactive approach to looking at these issues and I think harking back to what I mentioned before the DNO exposure for them there is really driving that um, I also have to say that I think um, CISOs chief information security officers and CTOs chief technical officers are starting to understand that cyber insurance is not a um, a, a threat to what they do it's another part of the jigsaw puzzle uh, as I mentioned before there's no amount of antiviral software or perimeter protection that's actually going to protect you in the event of a of a employee going rogue or a supply chain attack etc so uh, you know I think their CISOs and CTOs are starting to be aware of the opportunity for additional ex, for an additional if you like external parachute of protection yeah yeah a couple of questions come in about standards so one one specific one I guess one more general so question in the the chat bar about you know are there industry standards insurance industry standards around multi-factor authentication is there you know is and I suppose there's a wider point around that you mentioned some minimum and recommended standards being required by insurance insurers you know as the minimum standards are a prerequisite to getting coverage uh, do you see that the those standards are going to get tighter as as time goes by and is there is there a convergence as an industry view or is that likely to to vary from one insurer to another yeah, another great question and i think the big point there is that the minimum standards that we are seeing now are reactive because they are based on what has happened over the last say 24 months in the industry so what we're seeing now are standards that had they been in place 24 months ago the insurers wouldn't have had to deal with as many cyber incidents so I think as the threat environment changes uh, and the nature of claims changes potentially over the next few years we are likely to see additional and different standards being added to that list uh, it, it's um, it's a dynamic and evolving thing so I mean again it comes back to you need to be aware of what your policy requirements actually are and make sure that you're actually doing them. And on the MFA, is there a specific standard? Probably, probably uh, not. MFA, MFA is a really tricky area because that you can say that you have MFA, but a lot of insurers are saying, well, do you have MFA for um, VPN? Do you have MFA for remote access? Do you have MFA for that? So I, I use MFA in the general sense that can differ from market to market in terms of exactly what specifically they're looking for with MFA. But we are seeing insurers requiring a tightening up of MFA across the board. <clears throat> and I guess in terms of the, you know, the the policy and procedure controls that you know insurers may look for, you know, ins ins insured to have. If it turns out, you know, so these, the, you know, I imagine the questionnaire is being filled out as part of the, you know, part of the, the request for insurance and and. So the insured says that they have these policies and controls in place. Would then a failure to have complied with those, would that be likely to invalidate the cover? Um, a really, really good question. And I think that the answer to that in very simple terms is that it's a question of degree. Uh, yeah. The Insurance Act 
um, basically has put in place three key areas that are highlighted in terms of focus. One is that there is a duty on the insured to present their information fairly. They have to disclose material information clearly. Um, there's another aspect of the Insurance Act that relates to warranties and a breach of a warranty if there's something you've warranted in your application form, a breach of a warranty will not necessarily automatically discharge the insurer from liability. Um, there is a question of proportionate remedies now. Um, that's the third point, that where there has been a breach that wasn't deliberate or reckless, so it might have just been, you know, um, a, a particular door opened or vulnerability that was an accident or had been over, overlooked, if it doesn't go to the core of the of the risk, then it, it won't necessarily mean that there is no cover in place. It's a question of degree. There are possible remedies for the insured. It, it may be that the, the policy is still on foot, but the insurer might say that we would have entered into it on different terms uh, and that, that we may, might have charged a different premium for it. So there are by virtue of the insurance act, there are some workarounds now that don't deliver, that don't automatically mean that the, the policy will be at an end. Fine. Okay. A uh, couple of uh, other questions. Um, do you recommend appointing third parties to try and breach your systems to identify weaknesses? So we had, uh -huh. we had our last speaker was an ethical hacker. Is that something that you um, insurers recommend that people try? I, I actually think that's a wonderful um, idea because it really does put it in context for you when you see what can happen. And a lot of people think that they've got really top line uh, security protocols in place. And when they have an ethical hacker come in there and do their thing, it's, it's quite frightening and terrifying to see what information is actually available to them. Um, again, from an insurer's perspective, it's not something that if you've got it, you're going to get a, a lesser premium, a more favorable premium. It, it's part of the picture that we present to them in terms of you, you are an, an insured who takes responsibility for your security protocols. You have X, Y, Z processes and protocols and tools in place to do that. So, you know, it's all part of painting that picture. And, and we typically work with insureds, potential insureds, to create that picture. And, and all those sorts of tools work towards creating a better, more robust profile, essentially, cyber hygiene profile. Okay. Um... Another question, are insurers or brokers willing to offer training videos for staff to watch to assist insured? Is there no uh, out there you would recommend? Or That's a really great idea, a uh, really great question. I do know of a couple of insurers who do offer things like that. Um, and if the, the person who sent that through wants to send me an email, I can certainly come back to you with some specifics on that. Um, Yes, there are a number of apps too that I know some insurers have whereby they can essentially take you through a whole bunch of protocols which will um, assist you in, in keeping yourself safe and secure, definitely. Cool. Um, another question, um, getting to the bottom line, I guess, um, what, premium, you know, what are premiums like given the increased occurrences of cyber incidents and the potential for huge, lo huge losses? I imagine rising would be the simple answer. <laughs> Yes, definitely rising. Unfortunately, we are in a hard market. I think probably five years ago, you could answer a five question application form and be given cyber insurance. It would be one of the cheaper insurances that you would get. But as you can imagine, insurers are trying to uh, mitigate their losses that they've seen over the last few years. And we are now in a very, very hard market. Um, I suspect it's going to continue to be hard over the next uh, year to 18 months, two years, and then we'll, we'll see what happens after that. But um, certainly they're, they're not as cheap as they used to be, um, but they do serve a purpose. And, and I keep going back to that point about the breach response. That is absolutely key. And you're not going to get that under any of your other policies anywhere. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we can imagine coming into the office on a Monday morning and you've got a, a screen saying you've been hacked to pay X number of um, Bitcoin to such and such address immediately. Well, the, the comfort of knowing that you can pick up the phone, 24 seven phone number, and immediately you're going to be connected with a breach coach. I mean, that to me is, is the key aspect. They will then manage that whether it happens in the UK or, or and or anywhere around the world. They typically um, have access to people who can help you across the globe 
and then they will assist you with IT forensics, PR and crisis management, um, call center setup, ransomware negotiators, etc. So yeah, really it has a, it has a, a great um, function in that respect and it helps the business to get back up and running as soon as it possibly can. So the premiums are going up, but it's still good value for money. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a final question, and I just want to touch on the, the, the position with the fines under GDPR, UK GDPR. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned they're unlikely to be covered. I mean, I, I'm interested, you know, we know about the, the issue around, um, you know, recovering recovering monies where where your own action has been you know illegal and what the nature of fines are under gdpr it's a vexed issue i'm not aware there's been a court decision on it but is that an industry position now that, that these are not likely to be covered or are they're being excluded i think you suggested that they would be covered if it would be legal to 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 make the claim but is there a is there a kind of industry view on that uh, that's really interesting. Uh, the, the short answer is is that there has not, to my knowledge, yet been a court, a case go through the courts to try and question the whether or not the payment of a fine should be covered by a cyber insurance policy. And there have been some big fines, as we know, that have been that have been dished out by the ICO over the last um, few months. Uh, I'm not aware of any case that has challenged the insurability of that fine as yet. Um, the general premise is that a claimant is unable to benefit from their own illegal act, of course. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a matter of public policy there in terms of if you've done something wrong, you ought not to be able to get an insurance policy to cover it. But it's really interesting in and around the concept of fines for a data breach or a privacy breach, because you may have the most top line security in the country, and you've still somehow experienced a data breach. And the question there is whether or not um, there is, uh, to my mind, th there might be a, a, a nuance as to whether or not there is some criminal element involved in your actions. And if not, perhaps we will find that they are insurable, in which case a typical insurance policy would respond. Yeah, I mean, there's a question about, you know, what is the nature of the fine? Is it is it criminal, quasi-criminal or administrative? Correct and whether or not actually then that falls into that kind of principle of, I think Latin is ex terpi causa. So um, that, that, that idea. So it's interesting just to see where, where insurers are. I've heard most insurers say they don't think it will be covered. I think they're relying on that, that principle. I'm just interested to hear whether or not uh, it has gone further. I'm, I'm conscious we are due to finish at quarter to 12. We are at quarter to 12. So uh, Vanessa, uh, thank you ever so much, both for the presentation and for answering all of the questions. Um, it's, been, it's been very illuminating. Thank you to everyone who's been with us through the session. I hope you have found it useful. Just a final word to say, please, when we finish, could you please complete the survey? It does help us to shape these events and we will look forward, we hope, uh, to uh, you joining us on the next session on the 25th of November. So from me and from everybody else, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.